Preface to Industrial Biography Iron Workers and Toolmakers by Samuel Smiles. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Clive Catterall. Preface The author offers the following book as a continuation, in a more generally accessible form, of the series of memoirs of industrial men introduced in his Lives of the Engineers. While preparing that work, he frequently came across the tracks of celebrated inventors, mechanics, and ironworkers, the founders in a great measure of the modern industry of Britain, whose labours seemed to him well worthy of being traced out and placed on record, and the more so as their lives presented many points of curious and original interest. Having been encouraged to prosecute the subject by offers of assistance from some of the most eminent living mechanical engineers, he is now enabled to present the following further series of memoirs to the public. Without exaggerating the importance of this class of biography, it may at least be averred that it has not yet received its due share of attention. While commemorating the labours and honouring the names of those who have striven to elevate men above the material and mechanical, the labours of the important industrial class, to whom society owes so much of its comfort and well-being, are also entitled to consideration. Without derogating from the biographic claims of those who minister to intellect and taste, those who minister to utility need not be overlooked. When a Frenchman was praising to Sir John Sinclair, the artist who invented ruffles, the baronet shrewdly remarked that some merit was also due to the man who added the shirt. A distinguished living mechanic thus expresses himself to the author on this point. Kings, warriors, and statesmen have heretofore monopolized not only the pages of history, but also those of biography. Surely some niche ought to be found for the mechanic, without whose skill and labour society, as it is, could not exist. I do not begrudge destructive heroes their fame, but the constructive ones ought not to be forgotten and there is a heroism of skill and toil belonging to the latter class, worthy of as grateful record. Less perilous and romantic it may be than that of the other, but not less full of the results of human energy, bravery, and character. The lot of labour is indeed often a dull one, and it is doing a public service to endeavour to lighten it up by records of the struggles and triumphs of our more illustrious workers, and the results of their labours in the cause of human advancement. As respects the preparation of the following memoirs, the author's principal task has consisted in selecting and arranging the materials so liberally placed at his disposal by gentlemen, for the most part, personally acquainted with the subjects of them, and but for whose assistance the book could not have been written. The materials for the biography of Henry Maudsley, for instance, have been partly supplied by the late Mr. Joshua Field, F.R.S., his partner, but principally by Sir James Naismith, C.E., his distinguished pupil. In like manner, Mr. Joseph Penn, C.E., has supplied the chief material for the memoir of Joseph Clement, assisted by Mr. Wilkinson, Clement's nephew. The author has also had the valuable assistance of Mr. William Fairbairn, F.R.S., Mr. J. O. March, tool manufacturer, Mayor of Leeds, Mr. Richard Roberts, C.E., Mr. Henry Maudsley, C.E., and Mr. J. Kitson, Jr., iron manufacturer, Leeds, in the preparation of the other memoirs of mechanical engineers included in this volume. The materials for the memoirs of the early iron workers have in like manner been obtained for the most part from original sources. Those of the Darbys and Reynoldses from Mr. Dickinson of Colebrookdale, Mr. William Reynolds of Curdew, and Mr. William G. Norris of the former place, as well as from Mr. Anstis of Maidley Wood, who has kindly supplied the original records of the firm. The substance of the biographies of Benjamin Huntsman, the inventor of cast steel, has been furnished by his lineal representatives, and the facts embodied in the memoirs of Henry Court and David Mushet have been supplied by the sons of those inventors. To Mr. Andrew Kirkwood of Glasgow, the author is indebted for the memoir of James Beaumont Nielsen, inventor of the hot blast, 
and to Mr. Ralph Moore, Inspector of Mines in Scotland, for various information relative to the progress of the Scotch iron manufacture. The memoirs of Dud Dudley and Andrew Yarrington are almost the only ones in the series in preparing which material assistance has been derived from books. But these have been largely illustrated by facts contained in original documents preserved in the State Paper Office, the careful examination of which has been conducted by Mr. W. Walter Wilkins. It will thus be observed that most of the information embodied in this volume more especially that relating to the inventors of tools and machines, has heretofore existed only in the memories of the eminent mechanical engineers from whom it has been collected. The estimable Joshua Field has died since the date at which he communicated his recollections, and in a few more years many of the facts which have been caught and are here placed on record would probably in the ordinary course of things have passed into oblivion. As it is, the author feels that there are many gaps yet to be filled up. But the field of industrial biography is a wide one, and is open to all who will labour in it. London, October, 1863 End of Preface Chapter 1, Part 1 of Industrial Biography Iron Workers and Toolmakers by Samuel Smiles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Clive Catterall. Iron and Civilization, Part One. Iron is not only the soul of every other manufacture, but the mainspring, perhaps, of civilized society. Francis Horner. Were the use of iron lost among us? we should in a few ages be unavoidably reduced to the wants and ignorance of the ancient savage Americans. So that he who first made known the use of that contemptible mineral may be truly styled the father of arts and the author of plenty. John Locke When Captain Cook and the early navigators first sailed into the South Seas on their voyages of discovery, one of the things that struck them with most surprise was the avidity which the natives displayed for iron. "'Nothing would go down with our visitors,' said Cook, "'but metal, and iron was their beloved article. A nail would buy a good-sized pig, and on one occasion the navigator bought some four hundred pounds weight of fish for a few wretched knives improvised out of an old hoop. "'For iron tools,' said Captain Carteret, we might have purchased everything upon the Free Will Islands that we could have brought away. A few pieces of old iron hoop presented to one of the natives threw him into an ecstasy little short of distraction. At Otaheite the people were generally found well behaved and honest, but they were not proof against the fascinations of iron. Captain Cook says that one of them, after resisting all other temptations, was at length ensnared by the charms of a basket of nails. Another lurked about for several days, watching the opportunity to steal a coal rake. The navigators found they could pay their way from island to island merely with scraps of iron, which were as useful for the purpose as gold coins would have been in Europe. The drain, however, being continuous, Captain Cook became alarmed at finding his currency almost exhausted, and he relates his joy on recovering an old anchor which the French Captain Bougainville had lost at Bola Bola, on which he felt as an English banker would do, after a severe run upon him for gold, when suddenly placed in possession of a fresh store of bullion. The avidity for iron displayed by these poor islanders will not be wondered at when we consider that whoever among them was so fortunate as to obtain possession of an old nail, immediately became a man of greater power than his fellows and assumed the rank of capitalist. An Otaheitan chief, says Cook, who had got two nails in his possession, received no small emolument by letting out the use of them to his neighbours, for the purpose of boring holes when their own methods failed, or were thought too tedious. The native methods referred to by Cook were of a very clumsy sort, the principal tools of the Otaheitans being of wood, stone, and flint. 
Their adzes and axes were of stone. The gouge most commonly used by them was made out of the bone of a human forearm. Their substitute for a knife was a shell or a bit of flint or jasper. A shark's tooth, fixed to a piece of wood, served for an auger, a piece of coral for a file, and the skin of a stingray for a polisher. Their saw was made of jagged fish's teeth fixed upon a convex piece of hardwood. Their weapons were of a similarly rude description. Their clubs and axes were headed with stone, and their lances and arrows were tipped with flint. Fire was another agency employed by them, usually in boat-building. Thus the New Zealanders, whose tools were also of stone, wood, or bone, made their boats of the trunks of trees hollowed out by fire. The stone implements were fashioned, Captain Cook says, by rubbing one stone upon another until brought to the required shape. But after all, they were found very inefficient for their purpose. They soon became blunted and useless, and the laborious process of making new tools had to be begun again. The delight of the islanders at being put in possession of a material which was capable of taking a comparatively sharp edge and keeping it may therefore readily be imagined and hence the remarkable incidents to which we have referred in the experience of the early voyagers. In the minds of the natives iron became the representative of power, efficiency, and wealth, and they were ready almost to fall down and worship their new tools, esteeming the axe as a deity, offering sacrifices to the saw, and holding the knife in especial veneration. In the infancy of all nations, the same difficulties must have been experienced for want of tools before the arts of smelting and working in metals had become known. And it is not improbable that the Phoenician navigators, who first frequented our coasts, found the same avidity for bronze and iron existing among the poor Wodestane Britons, who flocked down to the shore to see their ships and exchange food and skins with them, that Captain Cook discovered more than two thousand years later among the natives of Otaheite and New Zealand. For the tools and weapons found in ancient burying places in all parts of Britain clearly show that these islands also have passed through the epoch of stone and flint. There was recently exhibited at Crystal Palace a collection of ancient European weapons and implements placed alongside a similar collection of articles brought from the South Seas. And they were in most respects so much alike that it was difficult to believe that they did not belong to the same race and period, instead of being the implements of races sundered by half a globe and living at periods more than two thousand years apart. Nearly every weapon in the one collection had its counterpart in the other. The mauls or celts of stone, the spearheads of flint or jasper, the arrowheads of flint or bone, and the saws of jagged stone, showing how human ingenuity under like circumstances, had resorted to like expedients. It would also appear that the ancient tribes in these islands, like the New Zealanders, used fire to hollow out their larger boats. Several specimens of this kind of vessel having been recently dug up in the valleys of Witham and the Clyde, some of the latter from under the very streets of modern Glasgow. Their smaller boats, or coracles, were made of osiers interwoven, covered with hides, and rigged with leathern sails and thong tackle. It will readily be imagined that anything like civilization, as at present understood, must have been next to impossible under such circumstances. Miserable indeed, says Carlyle, was the condition of the aboriginal savage, glaring fiercely from under his fleece of hair, which, with the beard, reached down to his loins, and hung round them like a matted cloak the rest of his body sheeted in its thick, natural fell. He loitered in the sunny places of the forest, living on wild fruits, or, as the ancient Caledonians, squatted himself in morasses, lurking for his bestial or human prey. Without implements, without arms, save the ball of heavy flint, to which, that his sole possession and defence might not be lost, he had attached a long cord of plaited thongs thereby recovering as well as hurling it with deadly, unerring skill. The injunction given to man to replenish the earth and subdue it 
could not possibly be fulfilled with implements of stone. To fell a tree with a flint hatchet would occupy the labour of a month, and to clear a small patch of ground for purpose of culture would require the combined efforts of a tribe. For the same reason dwellings could not be erected, and without dwellings domestic tranquillity, security, culture and refinement, especially in a rude climate, were all but impossible. Mr. Emerson well observes that the effect of a house is immense on human tranquillity, power and refinement. A man in a cave or a camp, a nomad, dies with no more estate than the wolf or the horse leaves. But so simple a labour as a house being achieved, his chief enemies are kept at bay. He is safe from the teeth of wild animals, from frost, sunstroke and weather, and fine faculties begin to yield their fine harvest. Inventions and arts are born, manners and social beauty and delight. But to build a house which would serve for shelter, for safety and for comfort, in a word as a home for the family which is the nucleus of society, better tools than those of stone were absolutely indispensable. Hence most of the early European tribes were nomadic. First hunters, wandering about from place to place like the American Indians after the game. Then shepherds, following the herds of animals, which they had learnt to tame, from one grazing ground to another, living upon their milk and flesh, and clothing themselves in their skins held together by leathern thongs. It was only when implements of metal had been invented that it was possible to practice the art of agriculture with any considerable success. Then tribes would cease from their wanderings and begin to form settlements, homesteads, villages and towns. An old Scandinavian legend thus curiously illustrates this last period. There was a giantess whose daughter one day saw a husbandman ploughing in his field. She ran and picked him up with her finger and thumb, put him and his plough and oxen into her apron, and carried them to her mother, saying, Mother, what sort of beetle is this that I have found wriggling in the sand? But the mother said, Put it away, my child. We must be gone out of this land, for these people will dwell in it. M. Warsai of Copenhagen, who has been followed by other antiquaries, has even gone so far as to divide the natural history of civilization into three epochs, according to the character of the tools used in each. The first was the stone period, in which the implements chiefly used were sticks, bones, stones and flints. The next was the bronze period, distinguished by the introduction and general use of a metal composed of copper and tin, requiring a comparatively low degree of temperature to smelt it and render it capable of being fashioned into weapons, tools, and implements. To make which, however, indicated a great advance in experience, sagacity, and skill in the manipulation of metals. With tools of bronze, to which considerable hardness could be given, trees were felled, stones hewn, houses and ships built, and agriculture practised with comparative facility. Last of all came the iron period, when the art of smelting and working that most difficult but widely diffused of the minerals was discovered, from which point the progress made in all the arts of life has been of the most remarkable character. Although Mr. Wright rejects this classification as empirical, because the periods are not capable of being clearly defined, and all the three kinds of implements are found to have been used at or about the same time, there is, nevertheless, reason to believe that it is, on the whole, well founded. It is doubtless true that implements of stone continued in use long after those of bronze and iron had been invented, arising most probably out of the dearness and scarcity of articles of metal. But when the art of smelting and working in iron and steel had sufficiently advanced, the use of stone, and afterwards of bronze tools and weapons, altogether ceased. The views of M. Worsai and the other continental antiquarians who follow his classification have indeed received remarkable confirmation of late years by the discoveries which have been made in the beds of most of the Swiss lakes. 
It appears that a subsidence took place in the waters of Lake Zurich in the year 1854, laying bare considerable portions of its bed. The adjoining proprietors proceeded to enclose the new land, and began by erecting permanent dikes to prevent the return of the waters. While carrying on the works, several rows of stakes were exposed, and on digging down the labourers turned up a number of pieces of charred wood, stones blackened by fire, utensils, bones, and other articles, showing that at some remote period a number of human beings had lived over the spot in dwellings supported by stakes driven into the bed of the lake. The discovery having attracted attention, explorations were made at other places, and it was shortly found that there was scarcely a lake in Switzerland which did not yield similar evidence of the existence of an ancient lacustrine or lake-dwelling population. Numbers of their tools and implements were brought to light, stone axes and saws, flint arrowheads, bone needles and such like, mixed with the bones of wild animals slain in the chase, pieces of old boats, portions of twisted branches, bark and rough planking of which their dwellings had been formed the latter still bearing the marks of rude tools by which they had been laboriously cut. In the most ancient or lowest series of deposits, no traces of metal, either of bronze or iron, were discovered, and it is most probable that these lake-dwellers lived in as primitive a state as the South Sea Islanders discovered by Captain Cook, and that the huts over the water in which they lived resembled those found in Papua and Borneo, and the islands of the Solomon group to this day. These aboriginal Swiss lake-dwellers seem to have been succeeded by a race of men using tools, implements, and ornaments of bronze. In some places the remains of this bronze period directly overlay those of the stone period, showing the latter to have been the most ancient. But in others the village sites are altogether distinct. The articles with which the metal implements are intermixed show that considerable progress has been made in the useful arts. The potter's wheel had been introduced, agriculture had begun, and wild animals had given place to tame ones. The abundance of bronze also shows that commerce must have existed to a certain extent, for tin, which enters into its composition, is a comparatively rare metal, and must necessarily have been imported from other European countries. The Swiss antiquarians are of opinion that the men of bronze suddenly invaded and extirpated the men of flint, and that at some still later period another stronger and more skilful race, supposed to have been Celts from Gaul, came armed with iron weapons, to whom the men of bronze succumbed, or with whom, more probably, they gradually intermingled. When iron, or rather steel, came into use, its superiority in affording a cutting edge was so decisive that it seems to have supplanted bronze almost at once the latter metal continuing to be employed only for the purpose of making scabbards or sword-handles. Shortly after the commencement of the Iron Age, the lake habitations were abandoned, the only settlement of this later epoch yet discovered being at Tien, or Lake Neufchatel. And it is a remarkable circumstance, showing the great antiquity of the lake dwellings, that they are not mentioned by any of the Roman historians. That iron should have been one of the last of the metals to come into general use is partly accounted for by the circumstance that iron, though one of the most generally diffused of minerals, never presents itself in a natural state except in meteorites, and that to recognise its ores and then to separate the metal from its matrix demands the exercise of no small amount of observation and invention. Persons unacquainted with minerals would be unable to discover the slightest affinity between the rough ironstone as brought up from the mine, and the iron or steel of commerce. To unpractised eyes they would seem to possess no properties in common, and it is only after subjecting the stone to severe processes of manufacture that usable metal can be obtained from it. The effectual reduction of the ore requires an intense heat, maintained by artificial methods such as furnaces and blowing apparatus but it is principally in combination with other elements that iron is so valuable when compared with other metals. Thus, when combined with carbon in varying proportions, substances are produced so different 
but each so valuable that they might almost be regarded in the light of distinct metals, for example as cast iron and cast and bar steel. The various qualities of iron, enabling it to be used for purposes so opposite as a steel pen and a railroad, the needle of a mariner's compass and an armstrong gun, a surgeon's lancet and a steam engine, the mainspring of a watch and an iron ship, a pair of scissors and a naismith hammer, a lady's earrings and a tubular bridge. The variety of purposes to which iron is thus capable of being applied renders it more use to mankind than all the other metals combined. Unlike iron, gold is found pure and in an almost workable state, and at an early period in history it seems to have been much more plentiful than iron or steel. But gold was unsuited for the purposes of tools, and would serve for neither a saw, a chisel, an axe, nor a sword, whilst tempered steel could answer all these purposes. Hence we find the early warlike nations making the backs of their swords of gold or copper, and economising their steel to form the cutting edge. This is illustrated by many ancient Scandinavian weapons in the museum at Copenhagen which indicate the greatest parsimony in the use of steel at a period when both gold and copper appear to have been comparatively abundant. The knowledge of smelting and working in iron, like most other arts, came from the East. Iron was especially valued for purposes of war, of which indeed it was regarded as the symbol, being called Mars by the Romans. We find frequent mention of it in the Bible. One of the earliest notices of the metal is in connection with the conquest of Judea by the Philistines. To complete the subjugation of the Israelites, their conquerors made captive all the smiths of the land, and carried them away. The Philistines felt their hold on the country was insecure so long as the inhabitants possessed the means of forging weapons. Hence there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. But the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share and his coulter, and his axe and his mattock. At a later period, when Jerusalem was taken by the Babylonians, one of their first acts was to carry the smiths and other craftsmen captives to Babylon. Deprived of their armourers, the Jews were rendered comparatively powerless. It was the knowledge of the art of iron forging which laid the foundation of the once great empire of the Turks. Gibbon relates that these people were originally despised as slaves of the powerful Khan of the Gugan. They occupied certain districts of the mountain ridge in the centre of Asia, called Emmaus, Kaf, and Altai, which yielded iron in large quantities. This metal the Turks were employed by the Khan to forge for his use in war. A bold leader arose among them, who persuaded the ironworkers that the arms they forged for their masters might in their own hands become the instruments of freedom. Sallying forth from their mountains, they set up their standard, and their weapons soon freed them. For centuries after, the Turkish nation continued to celebrate the event of their liberation by an annual ceremony, in which a piece of iron was heated in the fire, and a smith's hammer was successively handled by the prince and his nobles. We can only conjecture how the art of smelting iron was discovered, who first applied fire to the ore and made it plastic, who discovered fire itself and its uses in metallurgy, no one can tell. Tradition says that the metal was discovered through the accidental burning of a wood in Greece. Mr. Mushet thinks it more probable that the discovery was made on the conversion of wood into charcoal for culinary or chamber purposes. If a mass of ore, he says, accidentally dropped into the middle of a burning pile during a period of neglect, or during the existence of a thorough draught, a mixed mass, partly earthy, partly metallic, would be obtained, possessing ductility and extension under pressure. But if the conjecture is pushed still further, and we suppose that the ore was not an oxide, but rich in iron, magnetic, or spicular, the result would in all probability be a mass of perfectly malleable iron. I have seen this fact illustrated in the roasting of a species of ironstone, which was united with a considerable mass of bituminous matter. After a high temperature had been excited in the interior of the pile, plates of malleable iron of a tough and flexible nature were formed, 
and under circumstances where there was no fuel but that furnished by the ore itself. The metal once discovered, many attempts would be made to give to that which had been the effect of accident a more unerring result. The smelting of ore in an open heap of wood or charcoal being found tedious and wasteful, as well as uncertain, would naturally lead to the invention of a furnace, with the object of keeping the ore surrounded as much as possible with fuel while the process of conversion into iron was going forward. The low conical furnaces employed at this day by some of the tribes of Central and Southern America are perhaps very much the same in character as those adopted by the early tribes of all countries where iron was first made. Small openings at the lower end of the cone to admit the air, and a larger orifice at the top, would, with charcoal, be sufficient to produce the requisite degree of heat for the reduction of the ore. To this the foot-blast was added, as still used in Ceylon and in India, and afterwards the water-blast, as employed in Spain, where it is known as the Catalan Forge, along the coast of the Mediterranean and in some parts of America. It is worthy of remark that the ruder the method employed for the reduction of the ore, the better the quality of the iron usually is. Where the art is little advanced, only the most tractable ores are selected, and as charcoal is the only fuel used, the quality of the metal is almost invariably excellent. The ore being long exposed to the charcoal fire, and the quantity made small, the result is a metal having many of the qualities of steel, capable of being used for weapons or tools after a comparatively small amount of forging. Dr. Livingstone speaks of the excellent qualities of the iron made by the African tribes of the Zambezi, who refuse to use ordinary English iron, which they consider rotten. Dushailu also says of the fans that, in making their best knives and arrowheads, they will not use European or American iron, greatly preferring their own. The celebrated woots or steel of India, made in little cakes of only about two pounds weight, possesses qualities which no European steel can surpass. Out of this material the famous Damascus sword-blades were made, and its use for so long a period is perhaps one of the most striking proofs of the ancient civilization of India. End of chapter 1, part 1《ハッピーバーベキューライフ》ハッピーバーベキューライフ。ハッピーバーベキューライフ。ハッピーバーベキューライフ。ハッピーバーベキューライフ。ハッピーバーベキューライフ。ハッピーバーベキューライフ。ハッピーバーベキューライフ。ハッピーバーベキューライフ。ハッピーバーベキューライフ。ハッピーバーベキューライフ。The metal seems to have been already known to the tribes along the coast. The natives had probably smelted it themselves in their rude bloomeries, or obtained it from the Phoenicians in small quantities in exchange for skins and food or tin. We must, however, regard the stories told of the ancient British chariots, armed with swords or scythes, as altogether apocryphal. The existence of iron in sufficient quantity to be used in such a purpose is incompatible with contemporary facts, and unsupported by a single vestige remaining in our time. The country was then mostly forest, and the roads did not as yet exist upon which chariots could be used, whilst iron was too scarce to be mounted as scythes upon chariots, when the warriors themselves wanted it for swords. The orator Cicero, in a letter to Trebatius, then serving with the army in Britain, sarcastically advised him to capture and convey one of these vehicles to Italy for exhibition. But we do not hear that any specimen of the British war chariot was ever seen in Rome. It is only in the tumuli along the coast, or in those of the Romano-British period, that iron implements are ever found, whilst in the ancient burying places of the interior of the country they are altogether wanting. Herodian says of the British pursued by Severus through the fens and marshes of the east coast, that they wore iron hoops round their middles and their necks, esteeming them as ornaments and tokens of riches, in like manner as other barbarous peoples then esteemed ornaments of silver and gold. Their only money, according to Caesar, 
consisted of pieces of brass or iron reduced to a certain standard weight. It is particularly important to observe, says M. Warsai, that all the antiquities which have hitherto been found in the large burying places of the Iron Period, in Switzerland, Bavaria, Baden, France, England and the North, exhibit traces, more or less, of Roman influence. The Romans themselves used weapons of bronze when they could not obtain iron in sufficient quantity, and many of the Roman weapons dug out of the ancient tumuli are of that metal. They possessed the art of tempering and hardening bronze to such a degree as to enable them to manufacture swords of it of a pretty good edge, and in those countries where they penetrated, their bronze implements gradually supplanted those which had been previously fashioned of stone. Great quantities of bronze tools have been found in different parts of England, sometimes in heaps, as if they had been thrown away in basketfuls as things of little value. It has been conjectured that when the Romans came into Britain, they found the inhabitants, especially those to the northward, in very nearly the same state as Captain Cook and other voyagers found the inhabitants of the South Sea Islands, that the Britons parted with their food and valuables for tools of inferior metal made in imitation of their stone ones, but finding themselves cheated by the Romans, as the natives of Otaheite had been cheated by Europeans, the Britons relinquished the bad tools when they became acquainted with articles made of better metal. The Roman colonists were the first makers of iron in Britain on any large scale. They availed themselves of the mineral riches of the country wherever they went. Every year brings their extraordinary industrial activity more clearly to light. They not only occupied the best sites for trade, intersected the land with a complete system of well-constructed roads, studied our hills and valleys with towns, villages and pleasure houses, and availed themselves of our medicinal springs for purposes of baths to an extent not even exceeded at this day. But they explored our mines and quarries, and carried on the smelting and manufacture of metals in nearly all parts of the island. The heaps of mining refuse left by them in the valleys and along the hillsides of North Derbyshire are still spoken of by the country people as old man, or the old man's work. Year by year, from Dartmoor to the Moray Firth, the plough turns up fresh traces of their indefatigable industry and enterprise, in pigs of lead, implements of iron and bronze, vessels of pottery, coins and sculpture. And it is a remarkable circumstance that in several districts, where the existence of extensive iron beds had not been dreamt of until the last twenty years, as in Northamptonshire and North Yorkshire, the remains of ancient workings recently discovered show that the Roman colonists were fully acquainted with them. But the principal iron mines worked by that people were those which were most conveniently situated for the purposes of exportation, more especially in the southern counties and on the border of Wales. The extensive cinder heaps found in the forest of Dean, which formed the readiest resource of the modern iron smelter when improved processes enabled him to reduce them, show that their principal iron manufactures were carried on in that quarter. It is indeed a matter of history that about 1700 years since, A.D. 120, the Romans had forges in the west of England, both in the forest of Dean and in South Wales, and that they sent the metal from thence to Bristol, where it was forged and made into weapons for the use of the troops. Along the banks of the Wye, the ground is in many places a continuous bed of iron cinders, in which numerous remains have been found, furnishing unmistakable proofs of the Roman furnaces. At the same time, the iron ores of Sussex were extensively worked, as appears from the cinder heaps found at Maresfield, and several places in that county intermixed with Roman pottery, coins and other remains. In a bed of scoriae several acres in extent, at Old Land Farm in Maresfield, the Reverend Mr. Turner found the remains of Roman pottery so numerous that scarcely a barrowload of cinders was removed that did not contain several fragments, together with coins of the reigns of Nero, Aspasian, and Diocletian. In the turbulent infancy of nations, it is to be expected that we should hear more of the smith or worker in iron in connection with war than with more peaceful pursuits. 
although he was a nail-maker and a horseshoer, made axes, chisels, saws and hammers for the artificer, spades and hoes for the farmer, bolts and fastenings for the lord's castle gate and chains for his drawbridge, it was principally because of his skill in armour-work that he was esteemed. He made and mended the weapons used in the chase and in war, the gavelocks, bills and battle-axes. He tipped the bowmen's arrows and furnished the spearheads for the men-at-arms. But, above all, he forged the mail-coats and cuirasses of the chiefs, and welded their swords, on the temper and quality of which life, honour, and victory in battle depended. Hence the great estimation in which the smith was held in the Anglo-Saxon times. His person was protected by a double penalty. He was treated as an officer of the highest rank, and awarded the first place in precedency. After him ranked the maker of mead, and then the physician. In the royal court of Wales he sat in the great hall with the king and queen, next to the domestic chaplain. And even at that early day there seems to have been a hot spark in the smith's throat which needed much quenching, for he was entitled to a draught of every kind of liquor that was brought into the hall. The smith was thus a mighty man. The Saxon chronicle describes the valiant knight himself as a mighty war-smith, but the smith was greatest of all in his forging of swords, and the bards were wont to sing the praises of the knight's good sword and of the smith who made it, as well as of the knight himself who wielded it in battle. The most extraordinary powers were attributed to the weapon of steel when first invented. Its sharpness seemed so marvellous when compared with one of bronze, that with the vulgar nothing but magic could account for it. Traditions enshrined in fairy tales still survive in most countries illustrative of its magical properties. The weapon of bronze was dull, but that of steel was bright, the white sword of light, one touch of which broke spells, liberated enchanted princesses, and froze giant's marrow. King Arthur's magic sword, Excalibur, was regarded as almost heroic in the romance of chivalry. So were the swords Galatin of Sir Gawain and Joyeuse of Charlemagne, both of which were reputed to be the work of Wayland the Smith, about whose name clusters so much traditional glory as an ancient worker in metals. The heroes of the Northmen, in like manner, wielded magic swords. Olave the Norwegian possessed the sword Macabuin, forged by the dark smith of Drontheim, whose feats are recorded in the tales of the skulds. And so, in like manner, traditions of the supernatural power of the blacksmith are found existing to this day all over the Scottish Highlands. When William the Norman invaded Britain, he was well supplied with smiths. His followers were clad in armour of steel, and furnished with the best weapons of the time. Indeed, their superiority in this respect is supposed to have been the principal cause of William's victory over Harold, for the men of both armies were equal in point of bravery. The Normans had not only smiths to attend to the arms of the knights, but farriers to shoe their horses. Henry de Femarius, or Ferres, Prefectus Fabrorum, was one of the principal officers entrusted with the supervision of the conqueror's farriery department and long after the earldom was founded, his descendants continued to bear on their coat of arms the six horseshoes, indicative of their origin. William also gave the town of Northampton, with the hundred of Fackley, as a fief to Simon St. Liz, in consideration of his providing shoes for his horses. But though the practice of horseshoeing is said to have been introduced to the country at the time of the conquest, it is probably of an earlier date as according to Dugdale, an old Saxon tenant in the capity of Welbeck in Nottinghamshire, named Gamelbeer, held two carricates of land by the service of shoeing the king's palfrey on all four feet with the king's nails, as oft as the king should lie at the neighbouring manor of Mansfield. Although we hear of the smith mostly in connection with the fabrication of instruments of war in the Middle Ages, his importance was no less recognised in the ordinary affairs of rural and industrial life. He was, as it were, the rivet that held society together. Nothing could be done without him. Wherever tools or implements were wanted for building, for trade, or for husbandry, 
his skill was called into requisition. In remote places he was often the sole mechanic of his district. And besides being a tool-maker, a farrier, and agricultural implement-maker, he doctored cattle, drew teeth, practised phlebotomy, and sometimes officiated as parish clerk and general newsmonger. For the smithy was the very eye and tongue of the village. Hence Shakespeare's picture of the smith in King John. I saw a smith stand with his hammer thus, whilst his iron did on the anvil cool, with open mouth swallowing the tailor's news. The smith's tools were of many sorts, but the chief were his hammer, pincers, chisels, tongs, and anvil. It is astonishing what a variety of articles he turned out of his smithy by the help of these rude implements. In the tooling, chasing, and consummate knowledge of the capabilities of iron, he greatly surpassed the modern workman, for the medieval blacksmith was an artist as well as a workman. The numerous exquisite specimens of his handicraft, which exist in our old gateways, church doors, altar railings, and ornamented dogs and andirons, still serve as types for continual reproduction. He was, indeed, the most cunning workman of his time. But besides all this, he was an engineer. If a road had to be made, or a stream embanked, or a trench dug, he was invariably called upon to provide the tools, and often to direct the work. He was also the military engineer of his day, and as late as the reign of Edward the Third, we find the king repeatedly sending for the smiths from the forest of Dean to act as engineers for the royal army at the siege of Berwick. The smith, being thus the earliest and most important of mechanics, it will readily be understood how, at the time when surnames were adopted, his name should have been so common in all European countries. From whence came Smith, or be he knight or squire, but from the smith that forgeth in the fire? Hence the multitudinous family of smiths in England, in some cases vainly disguised under the smythe or the smythe, in Germany the Schmitz, in Italy the Fabri or Fabrici or Fabroni, in France the Lefebvres or Lefebvres, in Scotland the Gows, Gowans or Cowans. We have also among us the Brownsmiths or makers of brown bills, the Naysmiths or Nailsmiths, the Arrowsmiths or makers of arrowheads, the Spearsmiths or Spearmakers, the Shoesmiths or Horseshoers, the Goldsmiths or workers in gold, and many more. The smith proper was, however, the worker in iron, the maker of iron tools, implements, and arms. Hence this name exceeds in number that of all the others combined. In the course of time the smiths of a particular district began to distinguish themselves for their excellence in particular branches of ironwork. From being merely the retainer of some lordly or religious establishment, the smith worked to supply the general demand, and gradually became a manufacturer. Thus the maker of swords, tools, bits and nails congregated at Birmingham, the makers of knives and arrowheads at Sheffield. Chaucer speaks of the miller of Trumpington as provided with a Sheffield whittle. A Sheffield twittle bare he in his hose. The common English arrowheads manufactured at Sheffield were long celebrated for their excellent temper as Sheffield iron and steel plates are now. The Battle of Hamilton, fought in Scotland in 1402, was won mainly through their excellence. The historian records that they penetrated the armour of the Earl of Douglas, which had been three years in making, and they were so sharp and strong that no armour could repel them. The same arrowheads were found equally efficient against the French armour of the fields of Cressy and Agincourt. Although Scotland is now one of the principal sources from which our supplies of iron are drawn, it was in ancient times greatly distressed for want of the metal. The people were, as yet, too little skilled to be able to turn their great mineral wealth to account. Even in the time of Wallace they had scarcely emerged from the stone period, and were under the necessity of resisting their iron-armed English adversaries by means of rude weapons of that material. To supply themselves with swords and spearheads, they imported steel from Flanders, and the rest they obtained by marauding incursions into England. 
The district of Furness in Lancashire, then as now an iron-producing district, was frequently ravaged with that object, and on such occasions the Scotch seized and carried off all the manufactured iron they could find, preferring it, though so heavy, to every other kind of plunder. About the same period, however, iron must have been regarded as almost a precious metal, even in England itself, for we find that in Edward III's reign the pots, spits, and frying-pans of the royal kitchen were classified among His Majesty's jewels. The same famine of iron prevailed to a still greater extent in the highlands, where it was even more valued, as the clans lived chiefly by hunting and were in an almost constant state of feud. Hence the smith was a man of indispensable importance among the highlanders, and the possession of a skilled armourer was greatly valued by the chiefs. The story is told of some delinquency having been committed by a highland smith, on whom justice must be done. But as the chief could not dispense with the smith, he generously offered to hang two weavers in his stead. At length a great armourer arose in the highlands, who was able to forge armour that would resist the best Sheffield arrowheads, and to make swords that would vie with the best weapons of Toledo and Milan. This was the famous Andrea de Ferrara, whose swords still maintain their ancient reputation. This workman is supposed to have learned his art in the Italian city after which he was called, and returned to practice it in secrecy among the highland hills. Before him no man in Great Britain is said to have known how to temper a sword in such a way as to bend so that the point should touch the hilt and spring back uninjured. The swords of Andrea de Ferrara did this, and were accordingly in great request, for it was of every importance to the warrior that his weapon should be strong and sharp without being unwieldy, and that it should not be liable to snap in the act of combat. This celebrated smith, whose personal identity has become merged in the Andrea de Ferrara swords of his manufacture, pursued his craft in the highlands, where he employed a number of skilled workmen in forging weapons, devoting his own time principally to giving them the required temper. He is said to have worked in a dark cellar, the better to enable him to perceive the effect of the heat upon the metal, and to watch the nicety of the operation of tempering, as well as, possibly, to serve as a screen to his secret method of working. Long after Andrea de Ferrara's time, the Scotch swords were famous for their temper. Judge Marshal Fatton, who accompanied the Protector's expedition into Scotland in 1547, observing that, The Scots came with swords all broad and thin, of exceeding good temper, and universally so made to slice that I never saw none so good, so I think it hard to devise a better. The quality of the steel used for weapons of war was indeed of no less importance for the effectual defence of a country then than it is now. The courage of the attacking and defending forces being equal, the victory would necessarily rest with the party in possession of the best weapons. England herself has on more than one occasion been supposed to be in serious peril because of the decay of her iron manufactures. Before the Spanish Armada, the production of iron had been greatly discouraged because of the destruction of timber in the smelting of the ore, the art of reducing it with pit coal not having been yet invented, and we were consequently mainly dependent upon foreign countries for our supplies of the material out of which arms were made. The best iron came from Spain itself, then the most powerful nation in Europe, and as celebrated for the excellence of its weapons as for the discipline and valour of its troops. The Spaniards prided themselves upon the superiority of their iron, and regarded its scarcity in England as an important element in their calculations of the conquest of the country by their famous armada. I have heard, says Harrison, that when one of the greatest peers of Spain espied our nakedness in this behalf, and did solemnly utter in no obscure place that it would be an easy matter in short time to conquer England because it wanted armour, his words were not so rashly uttered as politely noted. The vigour of Queen Elizabeth promptly supplied a remedy by the large importations of iron which she caused to be made, principally from Sweden as well as by the increased activity of the forges in Sussex and the Forest of Dean. Whereby, adds Harrison, 
England obtained rest, that otherwise might have been sure of sharp and cruel wars. Thus a Spanish word uttered by one man at one time overthrew, or at the leastwise hindered, sundry privy practices of many at another. Nor has the subject which occupied the earnest attention of politicians in Queen Elizabeth's time ceased to be of interest. For, after the lapse of nearly three hundred years, we find the smith and the iron manufacturer still uppermost in public discussions. It has of late years been felt that our much-prized hearts of oak are no more able to stand against the prows of mail which are supposed to threaten them than the sticks and stones of the ancient tribes were able to resist the men armed with weapons of bronze or steel. What Solon said to Croesus when the latter was displaying his great treasures of gold still holds true. If another comes that hath better iron than you, he will be master of all that gold. So, when an alchemist waited upon the Duke of Brunswick during the Seven Years' War, and offered to communicate the secret of converting iron into gold, the Duke replied, By no means! I want all the iron I can find to resist my enemies. As for gold, I get it from England. Thus the strength and wealth of nations depends upon coal and iron, not forgetting men, far more than upon gold. Thanks to our Armstrongs and Whitworths, our Browns and our Smiths, the iron defences of England, manned by our soldiers and our sailors, furnish the assurance of continued security for our gold and our wealth, and, what is infinitely more precious, for our industry and our liberty. End of chapter 1《Chapter Two of Industrial Biography》Ironworkers and Toolmakers by Samuel Smiles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Clive Catterall. Early English Iron Manufacture. He that well observes it, and hath known the wields of Sussex, Surrey, and Kent, the grand nursery, especially of oak and beech shall find such an alteration within less than thirty years, as may well strike a fear, lest a few years more as pestilent as the former, will leave few good trees standing in those wields. Such a heat issueth out of the many forges and furnaces for the making of iron, and out of the glass-kilns, as hath devoured many famous woods within the wields. John Norden, Surveyor's Dialogue, 1607 Few records exist of the manufacture of iron in England in early times. After the Romans left the island, the British, or more probably the Teutonic tribes settled along the south coast, continued the smelting and manufacture of the metal after the methods taught them by the colonists. In the midst of the insecurity, however, engendered by civil war and social changes, the pursuits of industry must necessarily have been considerably interfered with, and the art of iron forging became neglected. No notice of iron being made in Sussex occurs in Doomsday Book, from which it would appear that the manufacture had in a great measure ceased in that county at the time of the conquest, though it was continued in the iron-producing districts bordering on Wales. In many of the Anglo-Saxon graves which have been opened, Long iron swords have been found, showing that weapons of that metal were in common use. But it is probable that iron was still scarce, as ploughs and other agricultural implements continued to be made of wood, one of the Anglo-Saxon laws enacting that no man should undertake to guide a plough who could not make one, and that the cords with which it was bound should be of twisted willows. The metal was held in esteem principally as the material of war. All male adults were required to be provided with weapons, and honour was awarded to such artificers as excelled in the fabrication of swords, arms, and defensive armour. Camden incidentally states that the manufacture of iron was continued in the western counties during the Saxon era, more particularly in the Forest of Dean, and that in the time of Edward the Confessor, the tribute paid by the city of Gloucester consisted almost entirely of iron rods, 
wrought to a size fit for making nails for the king's ships. An old religious writer speaks of the ironworks of that day as heathenish in their manners, puffed up with pride, and inflated with worldly prosperity. On the occasion of St. Egwin's visit to the smiths of Ulster, as we are told in the legend, he found them given up to every kind of luxury, and when he proceeded to preach unto them, they beat upon their anvils in contempt of his doctrine so as to completely deafen him, upon which he addressed his prayers to heaven, and the town was immediately destroyed. But the first reception given to John Wesley by the miners of the Forest of Dean, more than a thousand years later, was perhaps scarcely more gratifying than that given to St. Egwin. That working in iron was regarded as an honourable and useful calling in the Middle Ages is apparent from the extent to which it was followed by the monks, some of whom were excellent craftsmen. Thus St. Dunstan, who governed England in the time of Edwy the Fair, was a skilled blacksmith and metallurgist. He is said to have had a forge even in his bedroom, and it was there that his reputed encounter with Satan occurred, in which, of course, the saint came off the victor. There was another monk of St. Albans, called Anquetil, who flourished in the twelfth century, so famous for his skill as a worker in iron, silver, gold, jewellery, and gilding, that he was invited by the King of Denmark to be his goldsmith and banker. A pair of gold and silver candlesticks of his manufacture, presented by the abbot of St. Albans to Pope Adrian the Fourth, was so much esteemed for their exquisite workmanship that they were consecrated to St. Peter, and were the means of obtaining high ecclesiastical distinction for the abbey. We also find that the abbots of monasteries situated in the iron districts, among their other labours, devoted themselves to the manufacture of iron from the ore. The extensive beds of cinders still found in the immediate neighbourhood of Rivo and Hackness in Yorkshire show that the monks were well acquainted with the art of forging, and early turned to account the riches of the Cleveland ironstone. In the forest of Dean, also, the abbot of Flaxley was possessed of one stationary and one itinerant forge, by grant from Henry the Second, and he was allowed two oaks weekly for fuel, a privilege afterwards commuted in 1258 for abbot's wood of 872 acres, which was held by the abbey until its dissolution in the reign of Henry the Eighth. At the same time, the Earl of Warwick had forges at work in his woods at Lydney, and in 1282 as many as seventy-two forges were leased from the crown by various iron smelters in the forest of Dean. There are numerous indications of iron smelting having been conducted on a considerable scale, at some remote period, in the neighbourhood of Leeds in Yorkshire. In digging out the foundations of houses in Brigate, the principal street of that town, many bell pits have been brought to light, from which ironstone has been removed. The new cemetery at Bermontofts in the same town was, in like manner, found pitted over with these ancient holes. The miner seems to have dug a well about six feet in diameter, and so soon as he reached the mineral, he worked it away all round, leaving the bell-shaped cavities in question. He did not attempt any gallery excavations, but when the pit was exhausted a fresh one was sunk. The ore, when dug, was transported, most probably on horses' backs, to the adjacent districts for the convenience of fuel, for it was easier to carry the mineral to the wood, then exclusively used for smelting, than to bring the wood to the mineral. Hence the numerous heaps of scoriae found in the neighbourhood of Leeds, at Middleton, Whitkirk, and Horsforth, all within the borough. At Horsforth they are found in conglomerated masses from thirty to forty yards long, and of considerable width and depth. The remains of these cinder-beds in various positions, some of them near the summit of the hill, tend to show that, as the trees were consumed, a new wind-furnace was erected in another situation, in order to lessen the labour of carrying the fuel. There are also deposits of a similar kind at Kirkby Overblow, a village a few miles to the northeast of Leeds, and Thorsby states that the place was so called because it was the village of the ore blowers, hence the corruption of overblow. A discovery has recently been made among the papers of the Wentworth family 
of a contract for supplying wood and ore for the ore blooms at Kirkshill near Otley in the fourteenth century, though the manufacture near that place has long since ceased. Although the making of iron was thus carried on in various parts of England in the Middle Ages, the quantity produced was altogether insufficient to meet the ordinary demand, as it appears from our early records to have long continued one of the principal articles imported from foreign countries. English iron was not only dearer, but it was much inferior in quality to that manufactured abroad, and hence all the best arms and tools continue to be made of foreign iron. Indeed, the scarcity of this metal occasionally led to great inconvenience, and to prevent its rising in price, Parliament enacted, in 1354, that no iron, either wrought or unwrought, should be exported, under heavy penalties. For nearly two hundred years, that is, throughout the fourteenth and fifteenth centuries, the English market was principally supplied with iron and steel from Spain and Germany. The foreign merchants of the steel yard doing a large and profitable trade in those commodities. While the woollen and other branches of trade were making considerable progress, the manufacture of iron stood still. Among the lists of articles, the importation of which was prohibited in Edward the Fourth's reign, with a view to the protection of domestic manufactures, we find no mention of iron, which was still, as a matter of necessity, allowed to come freely from abroad. The first indications of revival in the iron manufacture showed themselves in Sussex, a district in which the Romans had established extensive works, and where smelting operations were carried on to a partial extent in the neighbourhood of Lewis in the thirteenth and fourteenth centuries, where the iron was principally made into nails and horseshoes. The county abounds in ironstone, which is contained in the sandstone beds of the forest ridge, lying between the chalk and oolite of the district, called by geologists the Hastings Sand. The beds run in a northwesterly direction by Ashburnham and Heathfield to Crowborough and thereabouts. In early times the region was covered with wood, and was known as the Great Forest of Anderida. The weald, or wildwood, abounded in oaks of great size, suitable for smelting ore, and the proximity of the mineral to the timber, as well as the situation of the district in the neighbourhood of the capital, sufficiently accounted for the Sussex ironworks being among the most important which existed in England, previous to the discovery of smelting by pit coal. The iron manufacturers of the South were especially busy during the 15th and 16th centuries. Their works were established near to beds of ore, and in places where water power existed, or could be provided by artificial means. Hence the numerous artificial ponds which are still found all over the Sussex iron district. Dams of earth called pond bays were thrown across watercourses with convenient outlets built of masonry, wherein was set the great wheel which worked the hammer or blew the furnace. Portions of the adjoining forest land were granted or leased to the iron smelters, and the many places still known by the name of Chart in the Weald probably mark the lands chartered for the purpose of supplying the ironworks with their necessary fuel. The cast iron tombstones and slabs in many Sussex churchyards, the andirons and chimney backs still found in old Sussex mansions and farmhouses, and such names as Furnace Place, Cinder Hill, Forge Farm and Hammer Pond, which are of very frequent occurrence throughout the county, clearly mark the extent and activity of this ancient branch of industry. Steel was also manufactured at several places in the county, more particularly at Steel Forge Land, Warbleton, and at Robertsbridge. The steel was said to be of good quality, resembling Swedish, both alike depending for their excellence on the exclusive use of charcoal in smelting the ore iron so produced, maintaining its superiority over coal smelted iron to this day. When cannon came to be employed in war, the nearness of Sussex to London and the sink ports gave it a great advantage over the remoter iron-producing districts in the north and west of England, 
and for a long time the ironworks of this county enjoyed almost a monopoly of the manufacture. The metal was still too precious to be used for cannon balls, which were hewn from stone from quarries on Maidstone Heath. Iron was only available, and that in limited quantities, for the fabrication of the cannon themselves, and wrought iron was chiefly used for the purpose. An old mortar, which formerly lay on Eridge Green, near Frant, is said to have been the first mortar made in England. Only the chamber was cast, while the tube consisted of bars of iron strongly hooped together. Although the local district says that Master Huggett and his man John, they did cast the first cannon, there is every reason to believe that both cannons and mortars were made in Sussex before Huggett's time. The old hooped guns in the tower being of the date of Henry the Sixth. The first cast iron cannons of English manufacture were made at Buxted in Sussex in 1543 by Ralph Hogg, master founder, who employed as his principal assistant one Peter Board, a Frenchman. Gun founding was a French invention, and Mr. Lower supposes that Hogg brought over Board from France to teach his workmen the method of casting the guns. About the same time, Hogg employed a skilled Flemish gunsmith named Peter van Hollet, who, according to Stowe, devised or caused to be made certain mortar pieces, being at the mouth from eleven to nine inches wide, for the use whereof the said Peter caused to be made certain hollow shot of cast iron to be stuffed with firework, whereof the bigger sort of the same had screws of iron to receive a match to carry fire for to break in small pieces the said hollow shot, whereof the smallest piece hitting a man would kill or spoil him. In short, Peter van Hollet here introduced the manufacture of the explosive shell, in the form in which it continued to be used down to our own day. Board, the Frenchman, afterwards set up business on his own account, making many guns, both of brass and iron, some of which are still preserved in the tower. Other workmen, learning the trade from him, also began to manufacture on their own account. One of Board's servants, named John Johnson, and after him his son Thomas, becoming famous for the excellence of their cast-iron guns. The Hogs continued the business for several generations, and became a wealthy county family. Huggett was another cannon-maker of repute and Owen became celebrated for his brass culverins. Mr. Lower mentions, as a curious instance of the tenacity with which families continue to follow a particular vocation, that many persons of the name Huggett still carry on the trade of blacksmith in East Sussex. But most of the early workmen are the Sussex ironworks, as in other branches of skilled industry in England during the sixteenth century, were foreigners, Flemish and French, many of whom had taken refuge in this country from the religious persecutions then raging abroad, while others, of special skill, were invited over by the iron manufacturers to assist their workmen in the art of metal founding. As much wealth was gained by the pursuit of the revived iron manufacture in Sussex, iron mills rapidly extended over the ore-yielding district. The landed proprietors entered with zeal into this new branch of industry, and when wood ran short, they did not hesitate to sacrifice their ancestral oaks to provide fuel for the furnaces. Mr. Lower says that even the most ancient families, such as the Nevilles, Howards, Percys, Stanleys, Montagues, Pelhams, Ashburnhams, Sydneys, Saxvilles, Dakers, and Finches, prosecuted the manufacture with all the apparent ardour of Birmingham and Wolverhampton men in modern times. William Penn, the courtier Quaker had iron furnaces at Hawkehurst and other places in Sussex. The ruins of the Ashburnham Forge, situated a few miles to the northeast of Battle, still serve to indicate the extent of the manufacture. At the upper part of the valley in which the works were situated, an artificial lake was formed by constructing an embankment across the watercourse descending from the higher ground and thus a sufficient fall of water was procured for the purpose of blowing the furnaces, the site of which is still marked by surrounding mounds of iron cinders and charcoal waste. 
three-quarters of a mile lower down the valley stood the forge, also provided with water-power for working the hammer. And some of the old buildings are still standing, among others the boring-house, of small size now used as an ordinary labourer's cottage, where the guns were bored. The machine was a mere upright drill worked by the water-wheel, which was only eighteen inches across the breast. The property belonged, as it still does, to the Ashburnham family, who were said to have derived great wealth from the manufacture of guns at their works, which were among the last carried on in Sussex. The Ashburnham iron was distinguished for its toughness, and was said to be equal to the best Spanish or Swedish iron. Many new men became enriched, and founded county families the Fuller family frankly avowing their origin by the singular motto of Carbone e Fokibibus, literally by charcoal and tongs. Men went into Sussex to push their fortunes at the forges, as they do now in Wales and Staffordshire, and they succeeded then, as they do now, by dint of application, industry, and energy. The Sussex Archaeological Papers for 1860 contain a curious record of such an adventurer in the history of the founder of the Gale family. Leonard Gale was born in 1620 at Riverhead near Sevenoaks, where his father pursued the trade of a blacksmith. When the youth had reached his seventeenth year, his father and mother, with five of their sons and daughters, died of the plague, Leonard and his brother being the only members of the family that survived. The patrimony of two hundred pounds left them was soon spent, after which Leonard paid off his servants, and took to work diligently at his father's trade. Saving a little money, he determined to go down into Sussex, where we shortly find him working the St. Leonard's Forge, and afterwards the Tensley Forge near Crawley, and the Cowden Ironworks, which then bore a high reputation. After forty years' labour, he accumulated a good fortune which he left to his son of the same name, who went on iron-forging, and eventually became a county gentleman, owner of the house and estate of Crabbet near Worth, and member of Parliament for East Grinstead. Several of the new families, however, after occupying a high position in the county, again subsided into the labouring class, illustrating the Lancashire proverb of twice clogs, once boots the sons squandering what the fathers had gathered, and falling back into the ranks again. Thus the great Fowles family of River Hall disappeared altogether from Sussex. One of them built the fine mansions of River Hall, noble even in decay. Another had a grant of free warren from King James over his estates at Wadhurst, Frant, Rotherfield and Mayfield. Mr. Lower says the fourth in descent from this person kept the turnpike gate at Wadhurst, and that the last of the family, a day labourer, emigrated to America in 1839, carrying with him, as the sole relic of his family's greatness, the royal grant of free warren granted to his ancestor. The Barhams and Mansers were also great ironmen, officiating as high sheriffs of the county at different times, and occupying spacious mansions. One branch of these families terminated, Mr. Lower says, with Nicholas Barham, who died in the workhouse at Wadhurst in 1788, and another continues to be represented by a wheelwright at Wadhurst of the same name. The iron manufacture of Sussex reached its height towards the close of the reign of Elizabeth, when the trade became so prosperous that instead of importing iron, England began to export it in considerable quantities in the shape of iron ordnance. Sir Thomas Leeton and Sir Henry Neville had obtained patents from the Queen which enabled them to send their ordnance abroad, the consequence of which was that the Spaniards were found arming their ships and fighting us with guns of our own manufacture. Sir Walter Raleigh, calling attention to the subject in the House of Commons, said, I am sure heretofore one ship of Her Majesty's was able to beat ten Spaniards, but now, by reason of our own ordnance, we hardly matched one to one. Proclamations were issued forbidding the export of iron and brass ordnance, and a bill was brought into Parliament to put a stop to the trade. 
but notwithstanding these prohibitions the sussex guns long continued to be smuggled out of the county in considerable numbers it is almost incredible says camden how many guns were made of iron in this county count gondomar the spanish ambassador well knew their goodness when he so often begged of king james the boon to export them though the king refused his sanction it appears that sir anthony shirley of weston an extensive iron master succeeded in forwarding to the king of spain a hundred pieces of cannon so active were the sussex manufacturers and so brisk was the trade they carried on that during the reign of james i it is supposed one half of the whole quantity of iron produced in england was made there simon sturtevant in his treatise of metallica published in sixteen twelve estimates the whole number of iron mills in england and wales at eight hundred of which he says there are four hundred mills in surrey kent and sussex as the townsmen of hazelmere have testified and numbered unto me but the townsmen of hazelmere must certainly have been exaggerating unless they counted smiths and farrier shops in the number of iron mills about the same time that sturtevant's treatise was published there appeared a treatise entitled the surveyor's dialogue by one john norden the object of which was to make out a case against the iron works and their being allowed to burn up the timber of the country for fuel yet norden does not make the number of iron works much more than a third of sturtevant's estimate he says i have heard that there are or lately were in sussex near one hundred and forty hammers and furnaces for iron and in it and surrey adjoining three or four glass houses even the smaller number stated by norden however shows that sussex was then regarded as the principal seat of the iron trade camden vividly describes the noise and bustle of the manufacture the working of the heavy hammers which beating upon the iron fill the neighbourhood round about day and night with continual noise these hammers were for the most part worked by the power of water carefully stored in the artificial hammer ponds above described the hammer shaft was usually of ash about nine feet long clamped at intervals with iron hoops it was worked by the revolutions of the water wheel furnished with projecting arms or knobs to raise the hammer which fell as each knob passed the rapidity of its action of course depending on the velocity with which the water wheel revolved the forge blast also worked for the most part by water power where the furnaces were small the blast was produced by leather bellows worked by hand or by a horse walking in a gin the foot blasts of the earlier iron smelters were so imperfect that but a small proportion of the ore was reduced so that the iron makers of the later times more particularly in the forest of dean instead of digging for ironstone resorted to the beds of ancient scoriae for their principal supply of the mineral notwithstanding the large number of furnaces in blast throughout the county of sussex at the period we refer to their produce was comparatively small and must not be measured by the enormous produce of modern ironworks for while an iron furnace of the present day will easily turn out a hundred and fifty tons of pig per week the best of the older furnaces did not produce more than from three to four tons one of the last extensive contracts executed in sussex was the casting of the iron rails which enclosed st paul's cathedral the contract was thought too large for one ironmaster to undertake and it was consequently distributed among several contractors though the principal part of the work was executed at lamberhurst near tunbridge wells but to produce the comparatively small quantity of iron turned out by the old works the consumption of timber was enormous for the making of every ton of pig iron required four loads of timber converted into charcoal fuel and the making of every ton of bar iron required three additional loads thus notwithstanding the indispensable need for iron the extension of the manufacture by threatening the destruction of the timber of the southern counties came to be regarded in the light of a national calamity up to a certain point the clearing of the weald of its dense growth of underwood had been of advantage by affording better opportunities for the operations of agriculture but the voracious iron mills were proceeding to swallow up everything that would burn 
and the old forest growths were rapidly disappearing. An entire wood was soon exhausted, and long time was needed before it grew again. At Lamberhurst alone, though the produce was only about five tons of iron a week, the annual consumption of wood was about two hundred thousand cords. Wood continued to be the only material used for fuel generally. A strong prejudice existed against the use of sea coal for domestic purposes. It therefore began to be feared that there would be no available fuel left within practical reach of the metropolis. And the contingency of having to face the rigorous cold of an English winter without fuel naturally occasioning much alarm, the action of the government was deemed necessary to remedy the apprehended evil. To check the destruction of wood near London, an act was passed in 1581 prohibiting its conversion into fuel for the making of iron within fourteen miles of the Thames, forbidding the erection of new ironworks within twenty-two miles of London, and restricting the number of works in Kent, Surrey and Sussex beyond the above limits. Similar enactments were made in future parliaments with the same object, which had the effect of checking the trade, and several of the Sussex ironmasters were under the necessity of removing their works elsewhere. Some of them migrated to Glamorganshire in South Wales because of the abundance of timber as well as ironstone in that quarter, and there set up their forges, more particularly at Aberdare and Merthyr Tydfil. Mr. Llewellyn has recently published an interesting account of their proceedings, with descriptions of their works, remains of which still exist at Lludcoed, Pontrins, and other places in the Aberdare Valley. Among the Sussex masters who settled in Glamorganshire for the purpose of carrying on the iron manufacture were Walter Burrell, the friend of John Ray the naturalist, one of the Morleys of Glynde in Sussex, the Relfs from Mayfield, and the Cheneys from Crawley. Notwithstanding these migrations of enterprising manufacturers, the iron trade of Sussex continued to exist until the middle of the seventeenth century, when the waste of timber was again urged upon the attention of Parliament and the penalties for infringing the statute seem to have been more rigorously enforced. The trade then suffered a more serious check, and during the civil wars a heavy blow was given to it by the destruction of the works belonging to all royalists, which was accomplished by a division of the army under Sir William Waller. Most of the Welsh ironworks were razed to the ground about the same time, and were not again rebuilt, and after the restoration in 1674 all the royal ironworks in the forest of Dean were demolished, leaving only such to be supplied with ore as were beyond the forest limits. The reason alleged for this measure being lest the iron manufacture should endanger the supply of timber, required for shipbuilding and other necessary purposes. From this time the iron manufacture of Sussex, as of England generally, rapidly declined. In 1740 there were only fifty-nine furnaces in all England of which ten were in Sussex, and in 1788 there were only two. A few years later, and the Sussex iron furnaces were blown out altogether. Farnhurst in western and Ashburnham in eastern Sussex witnessed the total extinction of the manufacture. The din of the iron hammer was hushed, the glare of the furnace faded, the last blast of the bellows was blown, and the district returned to its original rural solitude. Some of the furnace ponds were drained and planted with hops or willows, others formed beautiful lakes in retired pleasure grounds, while the remainder were used to drive flour mills, as the streams in North Kent, instead of driving fulling mills, were employed to work paper mills. All that now remains of the old ironworks are the extensive beds of cinders, from which material is occasionally taken to mend the Sussex roads and the numerous furnace ponds, hammer posts, forges and cinder places which mark the seats of the ancient manufacture. End of chapter 2